whatever we do with programming, there's going to be a bit of a cacophony about the place tonight. There's going to be things coming from different angles and um, that kind of buzz is going to be about the museum. Um, so we have to forget the idea that everything's going to sound absolutely perfect in a concert scenario and just live with the idea that it's going to be breathing and moving. There's going to be energy about the place. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's safe to say that, that this project is the largest scale late event that we have attempted here at the museum. Ordinarily we will use the ground floor spaces, but this project has taken over every ground floor space, those in the basement and those slightly above the ground floor as well, which logistically is a challenge, but we have lots of um, support from the RNCM, um, not just the students, but all the stage managers, um, and it's been planned really carefully, and it, that approach has really allowed us to be more ambitious than we otherwise might. It's pretty awesome actually because um, I used to come here as a child, kind of look at the mummies and it was it was really cool. So it's yeah, it's quite exciting. Both my pieces have elements, small elements of choreography. So from Cradle to Grave, Emma Ruth and I decided to use the length of the exhibition and have the performers perform around it, move around it as they perform, kind of symbolising the life cycle. And my other piece, Two Leopards, is, is a little bit more comical. It involves the characters pouncing out as they start the piece. We haven't actually had the opportunity to rehearse at all with the other musicians um, in the space. This is going to be the first time, so it's exciting and a bit scary. Well, it will be very exciting, definitely unlike anything I've ever done. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> open late every Friday evening which gives us a chance to put on events both in our lecture theatres but also in the galleries themselves that um, appeal to a broader audience, an audience who might not ordinarily visit museums and this very much, this project sits within that kind of model. It's music, it's taking a, a different sideways approach to the collection and it hopefully speaks to um, a public who maybe don't have so much specialist interest in the collections, but have a broader cultural interest and it's a new way of engaging with the collection. I'm finding it really exciting. I can't wait to see the piece actually in, in place by the statue because um, obviously you spend a lot of time in rehearsal with, with the flautists and we've practiced some movement as well as part of the concept of dance. Um, but to see them do that either side of the actual statue is going to be really exciting, so I can't wait. The uh, Sound Histories project needed a finale, I, I believe, and they needed they wanted to involve as many of the participating musicians as possible, which came up as a 152-piece orchestra. And then, when they looked at the logistics involved, they realised that music stands, lighting, concert setup was very unlikely to be feasible. So then I think probably early on in the thinking, the word improvisation must have cropped up. So I was asked if I would help devise a finale piece um, which, of course, I jumped at the opportunity.
The concept was left quite free for me to um, agonise over and put together. So I wasn't told what it would be about, which was great. So there was a lot of freedom there. And the first thing that struck me was that space is just cavernous. So before, before I even put together a notion of what the piece might sound like, I penciled in to come here with a saxophonist and he played for about 45 minutes. I recorded, walked around and just mapped the acoustic and the reverb of the space. You realise that the concert hall at the Royal Northern where we rehearse, one and a half second delay. The British Museum Great Court, six and a half seconds of very, very complicated reverberation. So at the very earliest opportunity, I thought we need to get that dealt with in rehearsals so that the musicians, when they come into the space and play for the performance itself, that they don't get thrown by the acoustic. We hired a silent disco, 160 headsets, and basically fed to each musician in headphones a replica of the British Museum reverb of what they were actually playing. And by positioning the headphones carefully, they could blend what they were actually doing with this synthesized reverberation. And I have to say, we did that for two days and it worked sensationally well. It exceeded my expectations. And the very good news is these musicians, right from the beginning of the first rehearsal, they came across with a huge generosity of spirit, an incredible bravery, and very open minds. And right from the first rehearsal, uh, my tail was wagging. It was just an absolute joy.